Hey guys, Hans here at Shield K9. Let's talk about how dogs learn. People are always asking me, what commands are you using? What treats are you using? What devices are you using? When can I use this device or that device? And I always say, whoa, whoa, pump the brakes. You don't even know how it all comes together. You don't even know how dogs think, how dogs learn. It kind of is like asking a carpenter why he's using a certain brand of skill saw or how long the nails are that he's using when you don't even know how the structure is built. So you need to have at least a basic, a cursory understanding of the theoretical framework under which dogs learn. So we have the usual operant conditioning, classical conditioning. If you do, if you're a science-based dog trainer, there are lectures on that on YouTube already. This isn't gonna be just one of those because I think the problem with understanding these theories is that they are one dimensional. It's just the dog is a blank slate under which you're gonna write whatever reinforcers and punishers you want. That assumption is a completely false premise from which you operate. Dogs are most certainly not blank slates. Obviously the level of blank slate that you have depends on the age of the dog, but even still, a six week old puppy, I'm sorry, it's not a blank slate because you have behavioral proclivity and drift. And what behavioral proclivity and drift describe is for me, genetic predisposition and learned behavior. So obviously if you have a six week old puppy, there isn't a whole lot of learned behavior there, but there is a whole lot of genetic predisposition. It's a huge part of who and what your dog is. I'm gonna take a step back, and we are gonna go into the operant conditioning and classical conditioning side very briefly. Now, operant conditioning can be separated into reinforcement and punishment. Reinforcement is anything that you do that creates behavior or strengthens behavior. Whether you wanna teach the dog something new or whether you wanna make something the dog already knows better, you're on the reinforcement side. Now, if I'm giving positive reinforcement, I'm now giving something desirable to the dog. Now here's where people often kind of start to get confused. Negative reinforcement is basically pressure to position. So if I do this and I push down on that leash and I create pressure and the dog lies down, that's negative reinforcement. I created discomfort, she went to the correct position, I removed the discomfort. Negative reinforcement, pressure to position. Positive reinforcement, giving of anything to the dog that the dog deems as pleasurable. So that's positive and negative reinforcement. Let's talk a little bit before we move on the limitations of positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. All these um, quadrants of operant conditioning have limitations, which is why we don't use them myopically, all right? We often use several in combination with one another. Now, positive reinforcement. The good things about positive reinforcement is it creates a pleasurable experience for the dog. Now, the limitation of positive reinforcement is desire. You're hoping that the dog has enough desire for the, the liver treats, the ball. He has more desire for that than for anything else in the world. Now, of course, this is not very realistic. There's so many things in the world that will distract your dog that will be more rewarding in that moment for your dog than the kibble, than the ball. So that's the limitation of positive reinforcement. You can create a lot of motivation in the dog, but you don't really have obligation. He only does things because he desires to do those things. And the idea that he's going to forever desire to do what you want him or her to do, that's a pretty stupid perception that anybody has. Now, negative reinforcement is basically pressuring the dog by creating slight discomfort in one area, and then when the dog moves to the correct desired behavior, you remove the discomfort. The good thing about it is you always have it available. I always have the ability to make pressure on the dog. The limitation to negative reinforcement is that for some dogs, it creates a lack of motivation. The dog does it, but they don't look happy doing it. Obviously, as dog trainers, we want our dogs to be obedient, but we also want the dogs to be happy. It's one of those things where for some dogs, and I always say for some dogs, because for some dogs, you can use negative reinforcement. They're just so naturally strong and open and confident that negative reinforcement isn't gonna bring them down. They're gonna become obedient and they're still gonna look really happy and open. But for some dogs, that lack of motivation, it, they're just not gonna, they're gonna look a little flat, okay? And we don't want that. All right, so now let's get into the punishment side. On the punishment side, we've got positive punishment and negative punishment. Now punishment is anything you do to the dog to make a behavior less likely or ultimately extinct, okay? So whatever behavioral contingency that you're targeting with your punishment, the goal is to make it less likely and ultimately non-existent. Punishment, like I said, is divided into two quadrants. We've got positive punishment 
a negative punishment. Now, positive punishment is the application of something to the dog that the dog deems as aversive. And negative punishment is the withholding of something that the dog wants because the dog didn't offer the desired behavior. So I'll give you an example of positive punishment. My dog is barking out the window, okay? So when he barks out the window, he's wearing a bark collar and every time he barks, he gets zapped, all right? And very quickly he learns every time I do this, woof, I get that, zap. And now very quickly he learns, okay, I, I just, I can't bark because if I bark, I'm gonna get zapped. Negative punishment. Like I said, it's withholding. So let's say I'm teaching a dog to lie down and I have the food in my hand and the dog really wants the food. And I tell the dog down and I, you know, have the food there and the dog sits instead. And I say, uh -uh, I'm not gonna reward you. You must lie down. So I'm withholding the food. So then the dog, instead of sitting, lies down. And of course I reward him and now I'm in the positive reinforcement. And then the dog learns, the thing you really want is withheld when you're offering undesirable behavior. And when you offer the desirable behavior, that thing that you want is given to you. We've got reinforcement, we've got punishment. Here's the thing with reinforcement and punishment. Again, you're always kind of battling the human ego with these things. We assume that we know what is reinforcement and what is punishment because we have a perception about it. So let me give you an example. I get a lot of dogs come in here. They could care less about food. So I'm really limiting myself if my only game is treats and the dog doesn't really like treats all that much. So I might say, well, I'm using positive reinforcement. Why isn't he motivated? Why does he look flat? Your positive reinforcement for him isn't really all that positive. Keep in mind now, guys, you don't get to decide what is a reinforcer for the dog and what is a punisher. And the same goes with punishment. The dog will tell you what works, whether it's a reinforcement, whether it's a punishment. Classical conditioning. It's not enough to know reinforcement and punishment. How do we make it work? How do we communicate the reinforcers and the punishers properly to the dog so he can kind of put these things together with specific behavioral contingencies so that we can now start to influence his behavior? Now we have this thing called markers or clicker, right? So let's talk about the clicker. Everybody knows the clicker. You make the click noise, you give the dog a piece of food. You make the click noise, you give the dog a piece of food. You do that a few times if he likes the food. After a while, you click and you're gonna get that. Where, where is it, where is it, where is it? Because you've classically conditioned the dog to that strange sound to believe that he's getting his paycheck. Classical conditioning, if you ever kind of studied it in school, you know, Pavlov and the dogs, right? He had a bunch of dogs in a room, he rang the bell, he fed the dogs. He rang the bell, he fed the dogs. After a while, he would ring the bell and the dogs would begin to salivate. So that's how much power the mark of the bell became for the dogs, right? Where they made that connection between that noise and that food. And it was far removed. If you're really a skilled trainer, you can actually click a behavior well before you reward the behavior. You can also use markers for your punishment. So I classically condition the dog for me, no becomes my punisher. If I say no, I'm conditioning the dog to believe that positive punishment is on the way. And this creates the ability to on a mark, reinforce a behavior or on a mark, suppress a behavior. You can also play with adding more markers that mean other things. But again, now we're getting into another area um, and I try to keep this as simple as I possibly can keep it. So now we're over here. We have behavioral proclivity and drift. Now behavioral proclivity and drift, like I already said, falls into genetic predisposition and learned behavior. So every dog that you get as a trainer has genetic predispositions and the breed and the breeding of that dog will determine the genetic predispositions. If you know anything about a Malinois, none of those things are a surprise for you, okay? That wasn't because we did this or that, that's just who she is. The mistake people make with genetic predisposition is they assume that they see this six to eight week old puppy in front of them and he's showing all that he's gonna show. Absolutely not. As the dog matures, more and more of the genetic predispositions kick in. I'll give you an example too quickly before I move on. A lot of my German Shepherd puppies, I don't see a lot of creative drive manifestation when they're young. You see lots of videos of my dog Gage. He's nuts for the ball. He's got like 10 out of 10 ball drive and I don't say that lightly. He's very dangerous with the ball. At three months old, he could have cared less about a ball. That kicked in about four months. And it, and it wasn't to the degree that it is now. And I'm sure it'll be even worse in another six months. So you have to understand the genetic predisposition doesn't immediately show itself right away. Learn behavior. Now this is important because as dog trainers, we often get dogs that are not puppies anymore. They had some experiences. Maybe you're adopting a rescue, you're purchasing an older dog. Learned behavior is a big part of it. Now genetic predisposition and learned behavior for me are kind of in the same category because the genetic predisposition of the dog 
will create behavioral proclivity. So let's say I have a dog who's really suspicious of strangers and they have that genetic predisposition. I have my Caucasian Oak Charka and he's young, he's, he's eight months old, nine months old. And he sees people on the street and they make him feel uncomfortable. He doesn't know why, but they just make him feel uncomfortable. So he starts trying to cope with that genetic predisposition by barking. And because he's now big, he's a hundred pounds, he looks intimidating, people start to avoid him. Well, now he's like, oh, they make me uncomfortable. I bark. They avoid me. Well, now we're getting into learned behaviors. Now he's learning to cope with his genetic predisposition by barking. You guys can start to see now where it goes, right? That's why I always kind of laugh, you know, when people are like, oh, you know, we rehab this, this dog from a fighting ring. If you have a dog that really was a dog fighter, that dog loved to do it. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been there. He wouldn't have been successful in that activity, okay? He was getting a lot of reinforcement from that activity because of his genetic predisposition. If I did the same, God forbid, this dog ended up in dog fighting. She would not find that reinforcing at all. It wouldn't work. She just wouldn't be able to do it. When you understand these things, genetic predisposition, learned behavior, reinforcement, punishment, and you understand how they impact behavior, it's not gonna be so hard for you to decide what specific commands you're gonna use or what devices you're gonna use. Because all those things, you know, what treats you're gonna use, all that stuff, once you understand how it all works, the basic framework from which you can operate, then you can select your specific technique that you're gonna use to train that dog or to fix that behavior. So I hope this helps you guys. Feel free to like, subscribe, and uh, comment below whether you agree or disagree.